Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Please join me in our greeting this morning. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to First Shine Methodist Church. Yes, you probably already guessed, I am not Wade. Um, Wade is filling in for Amanda down in Ignite. She's out today, and so I am in here with you all. It's always a pleasure to get to join, join with um, my fellows, uh, fellow folks here from First United and then any visitors that we have with us today. So just a few announcements. Um, they are published in the little handout that we have. But a couple of things, uh, VBS is coming up, and we are taking, you know, we still need, I don't know what for, I'm curious to see what this awesome uh, craft is going to be for the kiddos, but we're still looking for the um, sleeves from toilet paper and um, paper towels and things, so if you have some of those, please bring those in. Um, also, some opportunities to help with VBS. This coming Wednesday, there's going to be a time uh, they're putting the decorations together, and that will be um, Wednesday evening from 6 to 8. And VBS itself still looking for volunteers. And that will be June uh, 10th through the 13th. And it's in the morning this time. It's from 9 to noon. So we have some other announcements in the bulletin. And again, just a special, special reminder that June 9th, um, sadly, is going to be Wade and Cindy's last uh, service with us here as he moves on to Bethany over in Austin. So please do try to attend the service. And in true Methodist send-off tradition fashion, there will be a potluck. So we want to make sure everybody knows you're invited to that. Bring your best, best dish to send them forward. So and there are uh, some other announcements about Bible studies and things that are coming up in your bulletin as well. So check all of those different things out that we have here. So um, it is Trinity Sunday, so let us begin our service uh, as the acolytes bring in the light of Christ. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and 
from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the opening hymn, number 581, Lord, whose love through humble service. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please take a moment for silent personal confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading this morning comes from James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. 
What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but, not, but does not have works? Surely that faith cannot save, can it? <clears throat> if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able for hymn number 2223 in the faith we sing hymnal. They'll know we are Christians by our love. to hear the gospel reading this morning. And behold, it, it comes to us, sorry, from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. It's probably a familiar parable. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read? And he, the lawyer, answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You answered right, do this and you will live. But desiring to justify himself, the lawyer said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and we saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side also. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So at this time, I'm going to issue an invitation to any of the children in the, that are here today. You're welcome to stay with us in worship here. Or if you would rather, we have children's church going on where there's a special message that's been prepared for you. Looks like our guide is right here. So if any of the children want to come on up, we'll send you forth with a prayer. Loving Father, please be with the, the children always, but we with them today as they hear the word, um, and the, the word that is made special for them, and let them carry forth the word out to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is the fourth in our sermon series on answering God's call by taking a look at the membership vows of the United Methodist Church. Amanda and Wade have already shared the calls to pres uh, prayer presence and sharing our gifts. Um, um, Wade, today he entrusted me to speak about service at both Telfner and here at First Traditional Service. Bless you. And Amanda spoke about service last week at Ignite. Um, I, first of all, I just want to say that, you know, I love all the parables of Jesus. The whole um, book of Luke is just full of the parables, which are just wonderful messages in their own right. But I think I love the parable of the Good Samaritan most of all. You know, yes, I know the Good Samaritan is a fictitious hero, and there's other fictitious characters in this parable. However, there's so many layers of this story that's speaking to fulfilling or not fulfilling the vow of service, that I just, I just couldn't resist speaking about it today. Since I very first heard this parable as a young child at Kenwood United Methodist Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, this parable often comes to mind and has driven me to serve God and others through my past churches here at First United Methodist Church, me being active over at Telfner Church as well, and the many nonprofits that I work with or I've been able to work with throughout my life. So first in the parable, we meet the character of the man who was attacked. He was robbed, he was stripped, and he was left for dead. You know, did you realize Jesus never specified the nationality or anything else about him? I've always pictured him as a Jewish traveler, but he could have represented anyone of any race, any socioeconomic status, or any faith background from that geography and time period. Do you think he might have felt hopeless, fearing that these factors would keep anyone from stopping to help him? In today's world, he might represent the least, the last, and the lost, those living on the margin, margins, those that we often turn away from. You know, it seems noteworthy also that none of the three men checked on the victim's race, socioeconomic status, or faith. Perhaps the first two, the priest and the Levite, maybe they didn't because they just simply didn't want anything to do with him, regardless of his background. They may have had reasons that kept them from even helping a, a person that might have even been someone you know, like themselves or from their community. Because, but again, you know, they just kind of ignored him and went right on. But the third, the Samaritan, he didn't check because you know what? It didn't matter. It didn't matter to the Samaritan. He just saw a fellow human in desperate need of life-saving life care. It's ironic, isn't it, that the holy men, the priests and the Levite, <clears throat> they even went as far as crossing the road to avoid going by this person or helping him or anything. You know, why did they not even check on him? You know, many scholars have weighed in on this and offered their theories. Perhaps they were afraid that they would be defiled because at that time, you know, there were very strict religious rules around cleanliness and touching someone who was unclean or had open wounds. Or maybe that they were afraid that the robber or the robbers were still in the area and would attack them next. You know, they might even been suspicious of the victim. 
and thought that maybe that he was really a robber who was just lying in wait to attack them. You know, I must confess that sometimes I'm just like these guys. When I turn down the side street to avoid a person on the next corner that I see holding a sign seeking help. Finally, the Samaritan comes upon the man and renders aid without question, even to the point of dressing his wounds with oil and wine, using his own clothes as bandages, then taking him to a place of safety to personally care for him, for him through the night, and going even further to make arrangement for the additional care by the innkeeper until his return, and he was willing to pay for all of that out of his own pocket. You know, Jesus very pointedly used the despised Samaritan to be the hero in this story, to show that lawyer, to show others that were there, and to show us today that we are neighbors to all, even to enemies. You know, I also have wondered if Jesus maybe didn't use the Samaritan to personify himself, because at this time, you remember, he was starting to fall into disfavor with the religious authorities, and they were starting to despise him. Jesus was also very, very clear about the Samaritan's humble and unconditional compassion that he showed, which truly mirrored the compassion that Jesus always showed to those in need of healing. This connection between the fictional Good Samaritan and the flesh and bone Jesus is really what struck me. And it's the reason that if you have a bulletin on the cover that you will see, that's the artwork that I chose that Rebecca helped me find. It shows the Good Samaritan. But if you notice, look at the shadow that is cast. The shadow that's cast is the cross of Christ. The story of the Good Samaritan also tells us that we are to be Christ's hands and feet. So I have a question out there. Who are my fellow folks that read the upper room? There's my upper room readers that we have. Got a few of you out there. So I don't know if you caught it, but this week, Monday's um, devotional that was in the upper room was entitled Hands and Feet, and the author reflected on the story of the Good Samaritan. It was provided by a gentleman named Todd Dietrich from Wisconsin. The prayer focus that day was to serve others without hesitation. Without hesitation. Without judgment, without the expectation they will join the church, without personal reward for ourselves. There's another reminder being the hands and feet of Christ that comes to us from World War II. Some of you may have heard this story before. I will say it is one of those stories that whenever I read it again or I hear it recounted, it, it gives me chills. So there was a village in Europe that received very heavy bombing during World War II from the Germans. And in this town square, there was a statue of Christ. It had its arms outstretched, his hands wide open to folks. But during the blitz, the hands of that statue, they were blown off. They were just obliterated. They couldn't be found anywhere. And so after the bombing ended, one day, mysteriously, a handwritten sign appeared at the base of the statue that said, Christ has no hands to serve but yours. Now, fulfilling our vow of service is a very Christ-like action. In fact, through service, we are actually inducted into the CIA. Now, not the CIA you're thinking about. We're inducted into being Christians in action, which the hymn that we just sang, They Know We Are Christians by Our Love, describes so very well. So one of the principles of the United Methodist Church that I am most proud of is the one that John Wesley, our founder, um, used a lot, the call to social action. He became Christ's hands and feet by taking God's word into the bars, into the mines, into the slums that were there. Did you know that he is credited with creating Sunday school? John Wesley recruited teachers to be Christ's hands and feet to kind of on the sly teach children to read while they learned these Bible studies. Again, in a hopes that maybe they could get some education, they could escape that life of poverty and squalor that their families were living into. This call to social action has been with the Methodists throughout our history and compels each of us to speak out against and take action against injustices 
which is desperately needed in today's world. So I use John Wesley's word as my mantra. I would encourage you to do the same. John Wesley's saying was, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Another thing, with this being Memorial Day weekend, we also have to recognize those who gave all through service in the military. These brave men and women, they embodied John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down their life for their friends. You know, if you think about it, in many cases, those who were fighting foreign wars, they laid down their lives for people they didn't even know just in the hopes that freedom would come to everybody. I just want to say, well done, good and faithful service. Servants, may you rest in peace. Amen. Our epistle reading today, which Kathy read to us, came from James uh, chapter 2, verse 14 to 17, issues another challenge to us, and I'm going to reread it here. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but there's nothing about their physical needs that you take care of, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So while we know the power of God's grace when it comes to our action, James reminds us that as believers, we just can't talk about faith. We must live it and apply what we believe. When believers fail to serve, we miss out on the blessings that comes from when we act lovingly. If we act lovingly, we enjoy life more and we follow God's will closer. So again, back to the upper room piece from Todd Dietrich. He wrote, how are we being called to help God and others today? Now, he listed some examples of helping a neighbor mow their lawn and shovel snow. Well, remember, Todd's from Wisconsin, so some of us understand that. Um, giving a stranger along the roadside a meal. I keep Sonic and Chick-fil-A gift cards in my car to give to some folks that need a meal. I also kept some to give to my low-income and the homeless students when I taught high school. And sadly, there are more of them than you think or perhaps by befriending someone inside or outside the church who's lonely. You're either doing that on your own, through calls, cards, texts, bumping into them when you see them, or maybe you're doing something more formally through like our uh, Stevens Ministry program. You know, acts of service, and these random acts of kindness, they can be visible to others, or they can be invisible. Yet remember, all of these are seen by God and Jesus. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25, verses 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the, the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. So I just want you to think for a moment. You know, there are so many ways that you can plug in and you can help serve. And if you ever noticed, we have the little connect cards in the back of the pews there. There's a place to check off serving, serving, being a partner in ministry. It doesn't mean you have to be on a committee, but again, there's so many outreach activities that we have here. You know, just a few of them, I, and some more history, whether you know it or not, but Christ's Kitchen was birthed from this church back in the mid 80s. The ladies in the, at that time, United Methodist Women, had a study on world hunger. And one of the ladies stood up and said, you know what, we have hungry people here in town. And so they started out by, by giving homeless people or people in need peanut butter and honey sandwiches out of the trunk of their cars. We also helped to birth Habitat for Humanity from our Bridge Builders Home Repair Ministry that we have here. 
But there's just so many other ways you can plug in through Pumpkin Patch, Twice Plus Showroom, Vacation Bible School, like I mentioned, or just a lot of other activities. Or maybe it's just something very subtle, like answering the phones, or being someone who is helping to send cards, giving messages maybe monthly to different folks that need it. Maybe you're willing to serve homebound communion. But there's just a lot of ways, again, that you can connect in. So again, you have an opportunity to acknowledge that on the Connect card, or by all means, talk to one of the pastors or one of the church staff. And I know that I didn't touch on near all of the things that we do with this church, so if I left your group out, I apologize for that. Um, but I also want to go on, and I also want to say there are cautions to putting our faith into action through service. We need to be sure that we don't hoard the opportunity and we don't do it all ourselves. Do we have any people out there who do that? Or am I the only one? Okay, thank you for those of you who shook your head. So, so again, we need to be open to those who want to help and to allow them to serve God and others through a common ministry of service. You know, in doing so, we can answer the call to make disciples for the transformation of the world. Okay, I have another confession to make. Some of you are really going to laugh about this. I am the person who does the communion, steward, steward, and I have people that really want to come up and they're very willing to help. And sometimes I tell, no, 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 I have a special way to do it. You know, and I really realize that I am denying those folks an opportunity to plug in to serve God. Um, so I catch myself where I, I really need to not be that person who does things, you know, all, all alone because I do it my way or I don't want to inconvenience people. So don't be a Kathy. Um, so we also need to make sure that our service remains a ministry and doesn't become a job. We need to make sure that our service remains a ministry and doesn't become a job. And I have stolen this next part shamelessly from Pastor Dave McFadden. And I know that there are times too that I, like I said, need to listen, listen to his admonishment. Some people have a job in the church. Others get involved in a ministry. What's the difference? If you're doing it because nobody else will, then it's a job. If you're doing it to serve the Lord, it's a ministry. If you're doing it just well enough to get by, then it's a job. If you're doing it to the best of your ability, it's a ministry. If you're doing it so long as it doesn't interfere with other activities, it's a job. If you're committed to staying with it, even if it means letting go of other things, it's a ministry. If you quit because no one praised you or no one thanked you, it's a job. If you stay with it, even though no one even seems to notice, it's a ministry. If your concern is success, it's a job. If your concern is faithfulness, it's a ministry. You know, it's hard to get excited about a job, but it's almost impossible not to get excited about a ministry. If God calls you into ministry, don't treat it like a job. If you have a job in the church, give it up and find a ministry. God doesn't want us feeling stuck with a job, but excited and faithful to him in a ministry. So, to all the active Good Samaritans out there, keep up the good, or rather the God work. To others that have been thinking about how to better fulfill your vows, including that of service, and are seeking ways to put your faith into action, there are plenty of openings for more Good Samaritans in the CIA. Go forth and do good. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Please stand if you are able and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
And at this time, it's time for us to prepare our offering. Um, our offering not only of our financial gifts that we're returning back to God, but an offering of our time and our talents as well. Um, I do encourage you to text your prayer request into the number in the bulletin. I don't have the magic phone, but just know those prayer requests will go in to the, um, the staff and to the prayer team. So at this time, if the ushers would come forward for the offering.
You will notice in the bulletin that it does mention Holy Communion, uh, but without um, Wade here to officially consecrate the elements, we will um, have that back next week. So we're going to move into our time of prayers. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for the generosity of your people. Our gifts are an outpouring of your love that you first extended to us. We return to you a portion of what you have so freely given to us. Guide us in the use of these gifts in service to your kingdom. And Jesus, we lift to you the joys and the concerns that have been offered today. The joys and concerns that have been texted in, as well as those that remain in our hearts and private. We pray for peace and comfort, healing and mercy, reconciliation and hope. We offer to you our thanks and praise as we join our voices together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. It's number 584, Lord, You Give the Great Commission.
please go forward with this benediction as you go forth to, to do good. We've been called by worship to your service. Forth in your name we go. Lord, you do give the great commission. May we serve as you intend. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>